Hi everyone, I'm Jack Remling, Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on Concrete by Thomas Bernhardt, which is a dark and absolutely brutal examination of the European 20th century experience. And Bernhardt achieves that effect by using the book to tunnel into the mind of one character, his narrator Rudolf, uh, who's living outside of Vienna on an estate. And we learn about this character's you know, hopes, we learn about his memories, his consciousness, we learn about his failures because the book is primarily a book about failure. Personal failure, artistic failure, certainly. Uh, those, those are sort of dominant themes across the book. But as that unfolds, we also sense the failures of friends, the failures of family, the ways in which society fails us. And fundamentally, it becomes a book about how we fail ourselves and how we fail others who, who perhaps need us most at a certain time. Uh, and so it can be a very dark vision, that nihilistic at times, and it's probably not a book for everybody. Not just because it's unconventional. The, the book is a single paragraph. Now, it's not short. It's not a long book. It's 156 pages. So it's a long paragraph, but a short book. Uh, <laughs> but emotionally, it can be a very uh, taxing book to read. But the opening page sort of gives a sense of what, what we're in for. From March to December, writes Rudolph, while I was having to take large quantities of prednisolone, a fact which I am bound to record here, against the third acute of onset of my sarcoidosis, I assembled every possible book and article written by or about Mendelssohn Bartholdi, and visited every possible and impossible library in order to acquaint myself thoroughly with my favorite composer and his work, preparing myself with the most passionate seriousness for the task which I had been dreading throughout the preceding winter. And those those absurd juxtapositions that are occurring uh, recur throughout the book. It, it allows us to sense the sort of dark ironies that uh, Bernhard wants us to examine. Possible and impossible libraries, passionate seriousness for a task which he dreads. Um, and so we, we, we get a sense right away of the voice. It's a voice that is, that is you know, unhappy, that is sensing the, the doom and failure almost from the beginning. Because on the second page we have, we must be alone and free from all human contact if we wish to embark upon an intellectual task. And who would say that? There, there's a way in which the voice is not unlike the narrator of the posthumous memoirs of Bras Cubas from Machado de Assis, where it's so inward, it's so narcissistic, so uh, drawn into itself uh, that, that it becomes almost comic. It becomes, you know, surreal or absurd. And we start to sense that, that Bernhard, as much as we can sort of snicker at this narrator, he also really believes aspects of this because we start to understand his relationships with his family. He and his sister don't have a happy relationship. Uh, they, he, he invites her to visit him because he feels lonely. And then as soon as she arrives, he's frustrated and angry and wants her to leave. Um, and so he, he, cause as soon as she leaves, he'll be able to finally begin this great biography that he's never going to write a page of. Uh, so we get this. Your mistake, my sister had said, is to isolate yourself completely in your house. You don't go and visit friends any longer, though we have so many. What she said was true. But what does one mean by friends? We know a number of people, perhaps even a lot of people. There are a few whom we've known since we were children and who have not yet died or moved away for good. Every year we used to visit them frequently and they used to come to our house. But that doesn't make them friends, not by a long chalk. My sister is quick to call somebody a friend, even somebody she hardly knows if it suits her book. Come to think of it, I haven't any friends at all. Since I grew up, I haven't had a single friend. Friendship, what a leprous word. People use it every day ad nauseum, so that it's become utterly devalued, at least as much so as the word love, which has been trampled to death. Um, and so the despair that this character has, again, it seems, it's so over the top that it seems ridiculous, and yet at its core, it feels true. Uh, we, we want to laugh at this narrator, but also there's a sense of wanting to like give this person a hug. Um, but he can be re repulsive as a narrator. He's deeply selfish. He lives on this estate outside of Vienna and has all this, the, all this wealth, all this privilege, all this comfort, and is obsessed with, you know, despite all of that, is obsessed with failure. And of course, we get a sense of uh, Vienna. The scene today is dominated by baseness and stupidity and by the charlatanry which makes common cause with them. My Vienna has been totally ruined by tasteless, money-grubbing politicians and become unrecognizable. There are still some days when one gets a breath of the old air, but not for long. Then once more, everything is engulfed by the scum that has taken over the city in recent years. 
In Vienna today, art is nothing but a sickening farce. Music a worn out barrel organ, and literature a nightmare. I won't speak of philosophy, for even I can't find words to describe it, and I'm not one of the least imaginative people. For a long time, I used to think of Vienna as my city, as my home, in fact. But now I am bound to say that I don't feel at home in a cesspit. What? Uh, and, and so it seems as though, for the first 120, 125 pages, that we're going to spend the entire book with Rudolph and his deep meditations that are also a bit whiny, you know, the 20th century version of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. But then Bernhard inverts all of this and subverts everything he's been writing when he has an interaction occur on uh, the island of Mallorca. So the, our character leaves to, to get away from Vienna. He can't write at his estate outside of Vienna. He's, he's got to find somewhere else. So he's going to go on this vacation and that's where he'll write. And it's there that we really start to see him have an actually human interaction with another person. And so everything Bernhard has written, everything he's crafted about, you know, the, this narcissistic personal failure, the inability to achieve this great monumental work of scholarship in the biography, all of it is utterly meaningless, not because it's not something that Rudolph is accomplishing, but because of what happens in those final 30 pages when he interacts with a young woman who it becomes clear is a widow whose husband um, died in an accident. And the way in which he begins to contextualize her despair at the loss of her husband, her, her despair at this horrifying accident that occurred while they were on vacation against his own, you know, rambling fury is where we start to see this glimmer of hope, this glimmer of light that this, this narrator, Rudolph, could care about anyone else other than himself at the very end. And it's, it's, it's an incredibly tragic ending. Um, but it's an ending that allows us through that tragedy to sort of reflect back and look at this narrator and see a moment of change and, and almost a only, uh, almost a moment of hope, I, I would say. Uh, but this was my first work by Bernhard and it's, he's a writer I hadn't ever heard of until probably about five, six months ago. And then suddenly I, I was seeing a couple of people, know, uh, you know, putting up books by him. I thought that seems interesting. Let me learn about this guy. Uh, so this is my first, the first book I read from him. I may read Gargoyles at some point in the future. Uh, but there were many works, of course, that I was thinking of. I was certainly thinking of reading the trilogy from Brecca at Malloy last week, and I'm starting on Malone Dies. And so I, I think there's very clearly a, a link between those, the, those types of writing. Um, and not just because of the long paragraph or the modernist, but, but the ideas around isolation consciousness. I was reminded of Swan's Way from Marcel Proust and that, that meditation on memory. <laughs> um, I was uh, certainly reminded, as I mentioned, of the posthumous memoirs of Ross Kubas, and I'll link my videos on those books in the description box. I was reminded of Zeno's Conscience or the Confessions of Zeno from uh, Italo Svevo. I was reminded a little bit of Pale Fire from Vladimir Nabokov, um, in part for sort of the uh, tragicomic voice that occurs across that work and, and the uh, solipsistic way that we have our, our commentary on the great poem in Pale Fire. Um, I was reminded of other works on artistic failure like Honoré de Balzac's uh, The uh, Unknown Masterpiece or The Letter, The Lord Shondos Letter from Hugo von Hofmannsthal. And I was reminded, of course, of The Biographer's Tale by A.S. Byatt, which I read last fall. And there are certainly uh, aspects of the work that, that uh, I think diverge, but converge as well with concrete. Uh, so those were works I was reminded of. And I'd be curious to know if anybody else has read Bernhard, if, if you have another work from him that you'd recommend. So again, I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you.